We are pleased to have with us tonight some information that I think will be of importance to those of you who are in speech and hearing as well as those of you who are in mental retardation. We don't always have something that combines like we have with us tonight. Also, I'm sure that if you have been reading the literature, and if you're in any of our classes, I'm sure that you're reading the literature, whether you like it or not, you've run across the term operant conditioning. And so I hope that all of you have done your homework and are prepared to know what the term means tonight. One of the persons who has been doing a great deal of work in the field of speech for the mentally retarded is Dr. Richard Schiefelbush from the Bureau of Child Research, the University of Kansas. Their program has grown tremendously during the last few years and commands nationwide recognition. And so it is a pleasure for me tonight to bring to you Dr. Richard Schiefelbush, who will talk to us about some of the research that he's been doing and perhaps some of the implications it has for those of us who are working with the retarded. Dr. Schiefelbush. Thank you, Don. It is really a pleasure for me to be here. I have spoken before in your midst, at least I think some of you have been present, either at Bloomington or Terre Haute or at uh, Lafayette or some of the locations where I have had the privilege to appear before. And I must say that my remembrances of these appearances have been very reinforcing and it's a pleasure to appear again. I don't know why it is that Indiana audiences have somehow an edge over most, but perhaps it's because there have been leaders here in the state that have engendered a real interest in speech and language, and you really believe in what you're doing. And of course, this does tend to make for a more communicative arrangement, and certainly a better kind of set of communication conditions. I don't think it's uh, at all imagination on my part that I have noticed these things because I've heard it from others. And I think you're really privileged to be in a state where there is the kind of excitement that you apparently enjoy. I know it takes a lot of doing to create this and to keep a group moving ahead towards some common professional goals. These are very motivating and very important in the ultimate outcome. So indeed, it is a pleasure and I'm glad to be here. I must make one reference to something that I heard Max Steer say a few years ago about meetings. He told uh, when he appeared in Kansas before an audience about a PTA that he attended somewhere here in Indiana, uh, a PTA uh, which had some controversy among the members and in the organization over whether they should buy raincoats or uh, some kind of uh, of new uh, uh, what do we call them uh, belts or uh, insignia for for the patrolman, and this uh, controversy waxed very heated and came up for a vote three times to a tie vote each time, and uh, this consumed a great amount of time, uh, all of which uh, preceded his presentation. And finally, when it came up for the fourth time, after additional lengthy debate, the tie was broken, and one side won. And he said, the thing that they will never know is that I was the one that cast it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, it is perhaps also a privilege to, uh, depending on what you have on the agenda, <laughs> to, to be the, uh, the, the speaker before the business meeting. Although usually business meetings are of considerable value and interest, I know. The thing I should, uh, I guess, like to speak about tonight is, as your uh, master ceremonies, 
as indicated, a, uh, a general topic of operant, or if you want to call it behavioral, or functional analysis, there are several terms that are current, uh, principles involved in language, speech and language training or speech and language behavior. However, I don't want to begin with a kind of technical dissertation, and I'm going to try to avoid this, although I have tangible proof of having written, not uh, entirely for this evening, but partly apply uh, application for this evening, a paper entitled Applications of Principles of Operate Conditions Conditioning to Speech and Language Behavior. But it is real deadly for me to attempt to read a paper, and if you don't mind, I'll do my best to give you living prose from <laughs> the horse's mouth or <laughs> some such place. Uh, I would like to simply talk with you, literally, about this topic. And as a beginning, I should like to present to you a kind of general language model. And may I read about half a page be sure I have stated what I intend to state as a frame of reference for the discussion. And then I shall try to do better. Uh, this is based upon a simple four-part process of communication which might presumably take place between two people such as two children or a mother and a child or a clinician and a child. The first part is the initial verbal instruction or message of the speaker. The second part is the discrimination response of the listener. You might call that listening behavior or, or simply understanding, receptive speech or whatever. The third is the verbal feedback by the listener indicating to the speaker the nature of his discriminating response. This presumably has Q value, you see, for the person who gave the original message. And finally, the fourth is the modified response of the speaker derived, at least in part, from the feedback of his original message. Now, this simple sequential consideration of language can, of course, be initiated with the first step originating with either the adult or the child. In either event, there is a response chain which leads to a modification of the original message. The channels used by these two participants are presumably the channels used to describe all interpersonal events, that is, speaking and listening. They are employed here as a means of describing verbal events. They involve both visual and auditory cues as a part of the original message and vocal or non-vocal feedback from the listener following his discriminative response. Now, let's keep this four-part chain in mind as we think about a retarded or a handicapped child. More often than not, the child is the listener from, for the original message. That is to say, he is encountered or he is approached or he is, he is uh, talked to, commanded or something, usually by an adult. He is, more often than not, not the original initiator of the message, although this could happen. And uh, as we can see shortly, the arrangement is somewhat the same in either event. But let's suppose the adult initiates a command or a response of a verbal nature, and he presumably understands or has an attempt to understand what is said to him, and he provides some kind of response behavior. This presumably guides the adult, whether it's a teacher or a clinician, in modifying the original message, either to make it simpler, to repeat it again, to add some other cues to it so that it will increase the child's understanding. Now, if we analyze this response chain, we can see easily how it could break down in terms of its communication properties. The child might have a hearing loss and not understand the message. The child might have very limited language in the sense of conceptual uh, language. He might have very poor uh, understanding of the uh, orienting concepts that we assume that all children have, if 
if we don't know the child, it's a rather natural thing to assume that he understands up, down, forward, back, uh, in front of, behind, on top of, inside of, today, tomorrow, yesterday, uh, and such other many kind of orienting concept, concepts that allow for messages to be understood. He might not have this. Also, the child might be, as we sometimes say, disturbed. That is to say, is very poor attending behavior. And furthermore, he may be frightened of adults, and he may not relate very well to an adult who's trying to get him to do something. Uh, his experiences perhaps have been bad or frightening or aversive in some way, and so he might relate pretty well, if it, let's say, to maybe a female adult, but not a male adult, or he might to an older sibling or older child, but not to an authority figure. There's many, many things that might exist with this child to make him a poor attender or a poor listener. The child might also be a socially awkward child and very inexperienced, and so he may understand what is being said to him, but give almost no recognition of this fact, and so he provides very poor cues to the adult who is relating to him. <coughs> that is to say, very poor guiding or feedback cue, so the adult doesn't know what to do next. The child really evinces little or no understanding. In extreme forms, we say that such children are autistic or schizophrenic or something of this kind. But the feedback is, is of poor quality or, or misleading or, or worse. Now, uh, these are the two basic kind of considerations for the listener. But let's think for a moment about the speaker. The speaker says something to the child that may be appropriate or inappropriate, depending upon the understanding or skill of this adult person. And as a result of proper or improper feedback, the next thing the adult may do may also be inappropriate or maybe more appropriate or less appropriate, depending upon the skill and communication of this individual. So, you see, you've got two things to consider from the standpoint of the speaker. The original message may be appropriate or not, or in some degree appropriate or not, and what the person does is a modification from the feedback that he gets. It may be less or more appropriate. It may lead to impatience and aversive behavior, or it may lead to kindliness and tact and patience and skill. I mean, it could vary in many ways. Now let's take a kind of illustration of what might go on in a home. You may have in a home, a, let's say, a scene where you've got a five-year-old or four-and-a-half-year-old child and a mother who's seated working on some sewing or some kind of work that mothers have generally up their sleeve all the time. And all at once she realized that there was a pair of shears or scissors or something that is in the next room in a sewing basket on, on a table or in a drawer or something. So she says to the child, would you please go get the, pair, the, the, the long scissors for me? And so the little child has had some experience in this kind of uh, communication uh, situation. So the child trots into the other room and opens the drawer and there are four pairs of scissors there. And so the child calls back and say, says something like, mommy, is it the blunt, long blunt pair or is it the, the long pair with the sharp points? And the mother may say, well, it's the pair with the long point, the sharp points. So the child comes back in. Now, if you analyze this uh, verbal event, uh, or whatever you want to call it, verbal unit that has just taken place, there was an original request. There was a response on the part of the child, which was to go in take a look, decide she needed additional information, called back as a feedback to the mother, and the mother gave a modified response which allowed for the completion of the task which the communication was all about. Now presumably this kind of, of communication exchange takes part, place between a child and an adult in a home many, many times every day. Uh, we assume that 
this is going to happen more frequently if the child and the mother, or the child and the adult, usually it's the mother, are somewhat reinforcing. That is, they like each other. There's a confidence in their relationship. The mother knows approximately what the child can or cannot do as a verbal participant and participates as a kind of a guiding uh, initiator in many, many kinds of new experiences. Furthermore, the parent is a kind of a monitor so that if the original uh, message is not complete, understood, or entirely appropriate, it is corrected so that the child can participate comfortably as a part of the communication exchange. And this function of, of frequent monitoring for many kinds of new verbal events is presumably the means by which children acquire the complex behavior we call language. Now, can you imagine what would take place if you have a, an impatient, unreasoning, kind of rigid person who makes many demands on children and doesn't provide the comfortable means by which the child can follow through on the response? The child can provide appropriate uh, reactions to the original request. Or even situations where the child can initiate a request and have confidence in what the parent will do. The child makes a request that may go beyond his own verbal level to some degree. And, and the parent can interpret and provide a reinforcement by carrying out the request of the child. Now you notice I said a reinforcement. Basically, if what the child provides as a verbal request or a verbal uh, response accomplishes what the child wants from it, this is instrumentality. This is a kind of verbal function that is in itself reinforcing or valuable to the child. If, however, the child makes a verbal request, a verbal response, a verbal statement, and it results in an inappropriate feedback for him, what will he do in monitoring his original response? He may just discontinue it, or he may get very unhappy, or he may persist, as we say, in a kind of a compulsive way to repeat the same thing again. But he isn't involved in a kind of response arrangement that allows for new learning, for a kind of a comfortable development of new social skills. Uh, now you'll find that in many creative homes, children acquire these kinds of language behaviors very rapidly and with a great deal of comfort and satisfaction. They like people. They expect people to respond to them fun uh, functionally. Now if you study the early life history of a retarded child, you may find that these kinds of things don't happen uh, with great probability. Uh, as we say, the child's verbal efforts may not be consequated. This is a term used by some of our graduate students at the University of Kansas. Simply means that it doesn't result in the desired or the expected uh, kind of uh, feedback. In other words, the child gets feedback which is punishing rather than reinforcing. It doesn't lead to new verbal behavior. It may extinguish or tend to diminish. So if you study in a speech and hearing clinic the, the speech and language behavior of a nine-year-old retarded child, you may very probably have a child with quite an irregular, perhaps even disruptive, history as a speaker as a participant in a two-person arrangement of the four parts that I just briefly described. So you may, in trying to understand his speech and language, need to set up a two-person arrangement with yourself as the adult and try to discover what breaks down. I, I would seem to me this is a kind of a generalization as a starting point. You may be facing the child across the table in a kind of a comfortable arrangement. You may have some materials there. You may ask the child some questions to see whether the child understands by making an appropriate response in pointing to pictures or in selecting something from an array or in carrying out some suggestion of yours. You may start this very comfortably and easily and say, in effect, does the child understand and does he respond appropriately to 
requests or suggestions that I assume he probably can understand. Now, you may overshoot at first and assume some things that aren't there. And uh, that's very natural because your cues previously are very inexact. Even if you look at the record of the child, you may not get the appropriate guidelines. We were kind of astounded a few years ago in taking a kind of an approach to a simple picture language task. What we did was to get an artist to draw a half a dozen pictures of scenes that we thought the child had very likely participated in. It involved a front yard of a house, involved another was a living room with certain of the common uh, furnishings of a living room. Another was a playground with some, some equipment and play paraphernalia, and so on. We would have assumed that the child had already had some experience with these kind of arrangements. So we'd simply say to the child, tell us what you see. And the child might pause very reluctantly to provide any response. We simply say, it's all right. Uh, it's just that this is a nice picture, and maybe you can tell us what you see. So maybe the child will just point and say, teeter-totter. Uh, slide. Uh, there may be a pause, and then the child would say, grass, and that sort. Now, you may not immediately assume that this is the kind of the limit of the child's syntax and the child's, <laughs> and the child's uh, linguistic uh, structure, but at least in that original arrangement, this is what he provided you. So you may test it out a little bit more, and you can simply say, do you see a, uh, a little boy who's throwing a ball? And this may give the child a little bit of help. And can you tell me some other things like that that you see? And you're trying to encourage and, in a companion way, reinforce more language from the child. Now, this is a way of inducing eliciting uh, a new variety, perhaps, of responses if the child has this kind of language. Now, these are very informal means that I've just given you. Another way for you to try out some things with a child, as I said a moment ago, is simply to ask him to uh, show you things, to sort out things, to, to find something that's available there that uh, you would assume your directions would lead him to perform. If you want to do it, uh, as we attempted to do it, as a test item in the Parsons language sample, you could hand him a blank piece of paper and say, would you please write your name? But you didn't give him a pencil. <laughs> so if he says something like, I don't have a pencil, this is a kind of an appropriate verbal response which you assume would have some value or meaning as an indicator about this child. Or you could ask him to write something on the board and there's no chalk there. Or you could ask him to wind up a wind-up toy but there's no key. So and these are the kinds of things that could lead to requests on the part of the child which would enable him to go ahead and perform what you'd ask him to do. Well, if we get back to this four-part model that I started with, what you might initially want to know is, does he hear? Can he relate comfortably? What are some of his most distracting kind of social behaviors, if there are such? Uh, and can he offer requests or ask for things? And can he understand requests or statements that are made to him? Now, this is a kind of a functional uh, question that you're testing out. Assuming that there are two primary responses, listening and speaking. Does he have appropriate listening behavior, and can he exercise appropriately the expressive behavior? And if so, at what level of skill, at what kind of uh, degree of development? All of this is very general, is it not? But if you want to carry it further, as a researcher would do, or as a clinician would do, determine what parameters of language you want to know more about. 
Now, this may throw us all into a tailspin. What do I mean by language? And what should we try to teach a retarded child? Well, I must confess to you that this is the $64 question. I'm not at all sure that we all possess an adequate model of language that would enable us as clinicians to undertake a program, even if we knew how to program, or to set up some kind of a sequence of events, even if we were extremely skilled in doing so as clinicians. What should be taught? What's important for them to be able to do? Well, I've already indicated they ought to be able to listen and understand if they're going to participate as a learner in a classroom or as a child in a social context, or eventually if they're going to participate in some kind of vo vocational training, they have to have a vocabulary and a set of, of uh, listening skills that are appropriate to the tasks at hand. So you may teach listening behavior. It may be as simple as that. You may try to set up a repertoire of, uh, uh, or a hierarchy, let's say, of listening skills and train the child in successive order to master new levels on this hierarchy. Let me illustrate how you might set up an arrangement to do that. Let's just imagine for a moment that we have in addition to the table that we're sitting across each other at, across the middle of the table an opaque screen so that for the moment he can't see you, functionally he can only hear you. And suppose in front of the child you have a scrambled little pile of, of novel forms, not a dog and a horse in cutout profile, but, but just some irregular forms blobs, something that looked like a cutout of a Rorschach ink blot, or goodness knows, most any kind of irregular, non-nameable thing. You could call it a squib and a jar and something else. You could give symbols to each one of them, but you haven't. So all he has really is this little uh, array, scrambled array of, of novel forms. In front of you, you have an order, a sequence. You have all 10 or all 12 of them lined up in order so that you have them numbered. And so as the messenger now, like I had described earlier in the four-part sequence, you are the messenger and you say to the child, I would like to have you find the form that has four sides to it and two very sharp points and a kind of dark edge on one of the sharp points. And so you wait, and the child doesn't do anything. So you try more, and you give him additional information, hoping that he will perform it. Now, if the child has had some training, he may ask you for information. He may be undecided about which two it is, so he asks further. But the two of you are participating in a kind of a communication task arrangement that involves listening skills and understanding on his part and messenger skills on your part. And so you may find that this is too complex a thing for this child to do and you may place something simpler in front of him and you may work up to this where he can handle an, in an understanding way uh, the responses that derive from your instructions. So you teach him through some kind of a graded series to listen more intently, to understand more accurately, and to perform the tasks more, more uh, efficiently. Now, in doing this, you may decide that again and again the child is not performing in relation to certain kinds of cues that you're giving. Maybe the child doesn't have the concepts for these cues. So you may take some time out, you may sit down with the child, and you may teach him what you mean by pointed, or what you mean by blunt, or what you mean by indentation or whatever kind of language you're using. So then you go back and try the tasks again and the child can perform them more skillfully. If so, your instruction has had some value on him as a performer, as a listener, and presumably as a child who might perform in some kind of a learning arrangement. Now this is a very quick and very gross suggestion of a kind of 
arrangement that might teach listening behavior. Now suppose you go quite a little way with this child and you suddenly one day you say to him, now let's change places and you tell me which one you're looking at and I will make the choice from this pile where you've been. So the child is now a speaker and you're the listener. And so presumably this new role calls for a new set of skills, speaking skills. And here again, you then are a participant with him in a communication situation toward the completion of a task. And when you complete the task, it tells you something in terms of data as to the child's skill. So he has a new set of experiences, presumably successful experiences, again a graded sequence starting from some known kind of array to progressively more abstract, more difficult. So after a while you bring in another child and so you have a child speaker or messenger and a child listener and you have still a different set of tasks because instead of the skilled sophisticated helper over at the other side of the table whether it be the speaker or the listener you now have another child with about the same skill level as the child that is originally your subject and so you have to begin back on a lower level again because you don't have the degree or the sophistication of exchange that goes on between the two people now the reason I am giving you this imaginative kind of little uh, superficial experiment or clinical arrangement is because it seems to me this more nearly approximates the kind of language requirement the child is going to have to have to get along in a school or in an arrangement where there are other people. It's actually a functional level that you've got to tease out and then begin from in your training because he's got to perform as a speaker and he's got to perform as a listener and he's got to perform in a kind of sequential arrangement because every time you arrange two people in some kind of a functional communication situation they're both speakers and they're both listeners and it's what the child does in this arrangement that is the behavior you need to know it isn't the behavior that places him always as the passive listener, but as a functional participant. That is the information. And it is from that kind of a baseline that your training must be developed. This is the best quick overview I can provide as a kind of a model, as a kind of an arrangement, and as sort of an imaginative clinical situation. Now, fortunately, any clinic that I've ever seen could provide these implements that I've just described. We all have pictures. We all have some concepts of the fact that children use pronouns, prepositions, adverbs, verbs, nouns, etc. And you know that some of these are concept words that the child may or may not have. Uh, a preschool child very likely doesn't have the colors, doesn't have orientations to space and time, and uh, so forth. Well, what does this particular child have that you are interested in? It's necessary to know that because the child is going to have to use language in the sense of concepts in his role as a speaker and in his role as a listener. It's unavoidable because we talk about orientation kinds of things. We say to the child, go into the next room and get the scissors with the sharp point. That's a kind of request. Now, in studying the uh, institutionalized child, there are some rather surprising deficits that emerge. For instance, we rarely, if ever, hear an institutional child who's lived on a cottage for any length of time who asks questions. Why in the world don't they ask questions? Well, now you may speculate that they just have never learned that kind of uh, linguistic pattern. Or you may speculate that this kind of behavior is not reinforced. It may be ignored. 
or maybe they haven't seen the model of the adult asking a question in a kind of reinforcing manner. Maybe aides don't ask questions, maybe they issue commands. All we know is that as we study these kinds of linguistic issues, we find that that's the thing that the, the child does. He comes up and makes a kind, of, sometimes even absurd, kind of staccato command to see what the adult will do. It's sort of like he's asking a question by, by utilizing a command, sort of to test the limit. And what you do, of course, is not insignificant. What kind of feedback you give to this kind of a linguistic response or this kind of a verbal response may have some value. But it's kind of hard, I mean, for an adult to just have a child come up and say something absurd like, what, what are you doing here? Uh, what do you do? I mean, this is inappropriate behavior. You would like for the child to be able to say something that you could give some kind of appropriate response to. Well, I'm simply suggesting that an institution is a pretty much of a deficit arrangement for a child to learn a lot of language simply by the nature of the two-person arrangements that are provided. As we've often said, a cottage or an institution in general is a non-contingent environment, meaning that the child is usually not related to in the way that a creative parent would relate to a small child. Uh, the child is taught to sweep and to take care of the room and to get to the meals and to do many things that are requisite to the daily routine. And once the child is trained, he may encounter very little additional kind of instructional arrangements with adults, from whom presumably most of our language uh, is learned in childhood. Furthermore, since the other siblings, or the other I sh peers, I should say, also have deficit language, there is not an adequate kind of learning that takes place by example or by model. And so, on the whole, if you're going to be a language clinician in an institutional environment, you've got to set up the arrangements in the clinic, and you've got to set up other arrangements as well. You've got to set up maybe an experimental cottage where you train the aides <laughs> certain kinds of language functions which they can participate in with the children each day. If it's in a slum culture, you may have to bring in the mother since that is usually the member that is present in the home, uh, that you can be almost certain will be there, the mother or the grandmother, bring them in and give them some training about how children learn to talk. And then you can carry on both instruction of the child and the parent so that you increase the number of appropriate arrangements day by day. Now let's get back to what do you teach. Well, the linguists tell us that there are four main kind of compartments or subsections of linguistics. One of, is what they call phonology, which we're most familiar with because it includes what we call phonetics, or what the teacher may call phonemics, but it is literally the effort to break down the linguistic code into sound units, noises that make in aggregate words and, and the flow of speech. And of course they study this uh, phonology uh, much more intricately than we ordinarily have trained ourselves to do, depending upon what kind of a linguist it is and what the problem is that they're studying, they may go into this in a very definitive and intricate way. Another part, of course, is morphology, which is very frequently what we think of as the endings or the things which give units, like words or parts of words, uh, a kind of special meaning of their own. That is to say, the plurals and the past tenses and so forth. And then, of course, there's the syntax, which is the structure of the sentence. And finally, 
they have an, a dimension that they call semantics or meaning, which includes the concepts and all the rest. Now, which part of this linguistic are you, arrangement are you going to emphasize most? Because very likely a retarded child uh, has deficits in all areas. He's hard to understand, sometimes incomprehensible, sometimes understandable, but very, very unesthetic in the sense that he has an incomplete kind of phonological repertoire. Or he may get all mixed up in terms of the specific morphology. He may not understand past tense or plurals. Or he may foul this up. Or he may have what we sometimes call telegraphic speech in the sense that he mentions in a kind of a staccato way or a kind of continuity fashion some of the main words that enables you to understand what he's trying to say. But he may leave out a lot may leave out, for instance, the, the adverbs and the prepositions and, and the uh, pronouns and, and the articles and so on. So he has an incomplete code, as we say, or an incomplete syntax. Or he may simply have very little understandable, uh, meaningful conceptualization, uh, as what we call the symbols. What is the most important? Well, this is a question that's very difficult to answer, but I would simply submit that any or all parts of this should be teachable. It should be possible for a language clinician to develop procedures for teaching any part of it. But I think we first have to understand it more completely than most of us do. That is to say, if we're going to teach new concepts, we have to have some knowledge of what conceptual levels may be available. Where do you start? Well, some people have suggested you simply try to do a, a kind of a rough systems analysis of your own as to what kind of situations the child encounters each day and teach language that, or meanings that would fit to that. Some people have attempted to analyze a job situation in terms of the requisites that are most probable so that they could teach this kind of conceptual material to a child who's ready to take that kind of a job. Let's say it's a job in a, sh in a uh, cobbler shop or in a home or in some kind of a woodworking arrangement or whatever it may be, in a garage. There, there are quite a range of functions and words and meanings that pertain directly to that environment. That's not a very fancy way to do it, but it's uh, kind of constructive and, and uh, perhaps valuable. It would increase the child's confidence to be able to go, and when somebody says to him, go get a monkey wrench <laughs> or go get the ratchet wrench or whatever it is, he knows what they're talking about. It kind of reminds me, in a way, of how badly off I was at approximately 17 years of age when I got my first job away from home. When I was trying to go to college. and It was a depression and all. I got a job in a country club. And the first day I worked there, they had a dinner dance. And I worked till about 3 in the morning. And I'd never been up later than about quarter of 12, maybe 12, 15, before in my life. And I didn't know a condiment from a doily. And people kept shouting at me all night to go get this or that, and I didn't have the terminology. That's a pretty frustrating kind of experience. If you ever want to get thrown into that kind of an arrangement sometime without the con concepts that go with it, uh, or the experience, you might get some kind of a feeling for what a retarded child would go through who's placed on the job for the first time outside of the sheltered environment in which he has been taught. So I think uh, we perhaps shouldn't be too fancy, but try to develop some kind of an, an approach to the probabilities of what language is going to be required, required of the child. For instance, in the four-part chain that I mentioned earlier, where is he most likely to break down? Well, that would be, if you could pinpoint that, or what functions, 
Where is he the lowest in terms of skill? Those would be the things I would teach. And uh, except for children with very bad speech, it might not be articulation training at all. Depends on whether you can understand him or, or probably someone else can understand him. Because there is a limited amount of time. You can't take an infinite period of time with any child. So try to get a hold of those things which in your model of language and with your degree of understanding about the probabilities of the situation for the child would have the most value. Now I might say that what I have suggested applies in a general way to a slum child. We are currently trying to analyze what the conceptual language skill levels are that a kindergarten child should have. <laughs> I know this is a horrible job, but if you are going to set up a nursery school for slum children who have far, far to go, maybe too far to go, and you reason that the way out of this slum for this child is education, you have to somehow teach him those things that will help him get started in the public schools so that school experiences will be successful in reinforcing or rewarding and so that he doesn't rapidly fall behind on the achievement ladder. So what do you teach? What do you build into a preschool in a slum community? What concepts? What skills? What kinds of functions? Oh, that's a big question, isn't it? <coughs> Suppose you attempt to do the same thing with a cerebral palsy child, which happens to be an, an area that I spent a lot of time in years ago. I don't know that I have ever quite agreed with the people who spent acres of time teaching the child to say, I, uh, ooh, ah, an, t, ah, or when it took several months to teach what seemed to me to be about as functional if they taught the child to say something like dink or drink or something of this nature. Now it all depends on what one's philosophy is, I suppose. But children who have a difficult time learning units have got to have an adult who asks questions about what the most critical things are that should be taught. Because there isn't enough time to teach everything. Now, earlier today I mentioned something which seems to me has a great deal of value for people who want to teach children who have deficit behaviors. This is a concept that we have come to call a response class. We find that most all small children learn a great deal through what we call imitation, or what may be called imitation behavior. This simply means that they've got to observe and they've got to acquire the skill of response in relation to what they have observed if this is going to be added to their repertoire. They see a model of it. They see it being acted out or see, they see it being done, and so they learn to do it. This is how most little kids learn to swim, to dive, to run downstairs, and many, many kinds of things. They see it happen, they try it out, they acquire it, they can do it. If you put children together in a group who come over from Germany and they're put with American children, they learn Midwestern English in a startlingly short period of time simply by listening to each other. And they get it very largely, I think, by imitation, quite apart from adult tutoring. But many of the things that they need to learn, they learn from adults. But if a child doesn't have this kind of learning behavior, that is to say, he is around a lot of things and he never acquires them. And this is often true for retarded children. Then teach him imitation as a response class. Teach him how to imitate. 
Uh, we have uh, quite a little bit of research uh, to report on this, research that uh, has done, been done primarily by Don Baer, Todd Risley, Mont Wolf, two or three others at the University of Kansas. And this work is primarily done in the Division of Child Development. They simply have started with very gross kind of gestural responses. And initially, they may, it may take them several sessions to teach one response. They may have to teach kind of an approximation of a response first, reinforce it before they can elicit a response such as that or this or, or that. Just some kind of unit of gestural response. Furthermore, they find that initially, when they've taught something like this, it doesn't mean initially that they're going to be able to do this or that. Uh, it may be that they'll have to teach each imitated response separately. And it may take 15 or 20 of these before it generalizes so that you can start some kind of new gesture and the child will immediately respond to it without a good deal of instruction. And so the child learns what you call a general, generalized imitated response behavior or a response class. Now after the child learns to respond imitatively, you can go quite rapidly. You can teach a repertoire of new responses rather quickly, whereas it may have been painfully slow to acquire this original few from which the generalization is developed. And uh, in their data, they show that they can gradually go from these gross gestural respo imitated responses to verbal imitations. And the sound barrier that we sometimes call it is sometimes a little hard to pierce for a given child. He may learn quite a, an array of new imitated responses of a gestural order, and, and now you present him with a, a, verbal, a verbal response and you get silence. So you may have to combine this with a gestural response so that he gives them together, a gestural response that he's already learned. But gradually you can build over. So he's responding now to gross verbal exchange responses. And these can gradually be shaped up into a context. Uh, they have a kind of uh, intriguing description of how they taught a very uh, limited child to say hi in the hallway. They had to actually have two people to teach this to the child. One was the person who accompanied the child down the hall, who, who had taught the child to say hi, and who had certain, let's say, response properties that led to this. And they had to have another person who came by as a greeter so the child would learn to say hi at the appropriate moment when he was confronted with the person coming toward him. Very quickly, he's reinforced for this, of course, at that point. But after they'd gone through the imitation training, the child had learned the imitation response and included in it, as part of the repertoire, verbal responses such as hi in context. Then, at this point, they brought in the aide. And the aide accompanied the person down the hall, and along came the person toward her, and she says, hi. And as Don Baer describes it, it almost had the effect on the aide of, of hearing a dog or some pet who had been in the institution for years, suddenly come up and say hi. <laughs> that is the, the same kind of general surprise effect. So I, I'm simply introducing this to suggest that it is likely possible that if we study units of behavior, there are response classes that we can determine and teach, which will increase the child's social capability. And uh, I don't know that uh, this is entirely the province of a speech clinician or a psychologist or any person. As far as I know, these are kind of new 
probabilities in the minds of most any professional person. Maybe the nurses will beat us all to it, I don't know. But I'm simply saying that we should look within some kind of a communication model, utilizing some kind of parameters that we call language, for economical ways to teach functional things that children are going to use as speakers and listeners. And this kind of effort may increase the validity and the probability that what we're doing have value. But perhaps it's a little bit of an overstatement, but not very much, for us to say that it might actually give some clinicians a reason for being beyond what they now enjoy. Because it seems to me that what many of us do have not completely been validated in terms of functional value or effect for children. We have some kind of probabilities that is valuable, but it's not really data in the sense that you'd set it up in an experiment. You may spend a year and a half working with a child and about the only validation you have that what you're doing has real functional value is the teacher comes in one day and says, my, she gets along much better in the class today. Well, that's, don't knock that. It's about the best kind of validation we have. But it seems to me we do need a more complete system, including a model in which we can carry out the functions and test out what we're doing. Thank you. We have a question that anyone wishes to bring for. I see Mrs. Hoops back there just dying to ask. If, if these are, are available to us, of course, because uh, essentially an intelligence test is a language test. Uh, not entirely, but the nature of the tasks that are presented and the way they're presented. If you think about it in the light of what I have just talked about, it's a two-person arrangement. And the child is primarily a listener and a performer to an adult who is the tester and the messenger. And in a sense, it functionally tests the child's skills as a communicator, including concept levels, skills in responding, confidence in the arrangement, previous experience with adults, and a variety of other things. It's a very natural task arrangement of the kind I described. If you were to take away the novel forms and the opaque screen and, and lay a Terman Merrill, <laughs> Stanford Binet, Form L <laughs> there and administer a test, you'd have virtually the same kind of, of a task requirement with more variety than I just described. Now, of course you should. But uh, we're not usually taught to do this, and uh, I think it takes a rather perceptive person to see that uh, this does indeed have value. What kind of, what kind of tasks did he fail? <laughs> and uh, did he fail them completely or partially? Did he only fail them because he ran out of time? Is he a child who has difficulty with timed items, performing better on untimed ones? There's a quite a number of cues that you could get from such a, a wealth of data that would tell you about the child. And I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes, but when you view test results in the, in the manner that we've just analyzed them, 
Isn't it just a little bit ridiculous to assume that children have fixed intelligence? Unless you assume that their language skills are fixed and non-changeable. And, non and that is the way we determine intelligence. We determine it by a two-person system with a variety of tasks which call for communication behavior. How many of you have administered a, an intelligence test? How many of you were shook the first time you had to administer one to your supervisor? Am I the only one that actually had the bucks? I never have done anything as difficult socially in my life. I was all fingers and thumbs and elbows. I dropped stuff on the floor. Finally, it reached a point where I had to break down and sort of laugh at myself, and I got, fortunately, a little laugh reinforcement back, and it helped. <laughs> <laughs> it's no pud, even for the, for the person who administers the test. But it's particularly difficult for a child who's had an incomplete kind of social success experience. I believe so. We do call it here and now behavior. Call it what? We do call it here and now behavior. Right. That's very good. And if we call it more than that, I think we're inferring more than we know. Yeah. Well, are there other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I dare say that your example that you gave us behind the screen was just an example that uh, it struck me that if any of my students were to give this kind of a message to a retarded preschool child, four sides, two mm. sharp corners, and indentation, I think it was. I said, you better start over again. Well, you see, you're, you're uh, very correct in assuming that a child, a preschool child, cannot perform in that kind of a sophisticated arrangement. We have tried it out on slum children, however, with simple materials. And it not only is that some of them can perform in that kind of a task arrangement, but you can teach them certain skills to make them better performers. It is a kind of a valid arrangement. It depends on how you lead up to it and what kind of materials you use. And you don't need to put an opaque screen there. It's just that that focuses on a class of a verbal skill that you otherwise wouldn't be asking for because the visual cues are very prominent with, with children, of course. And you take those cues away, they've got to listen, and it calls for a different level of understanding or sophistication. It emphasizes another thing. There are two primary channels <laughs> that you ordinarily use, and not exclusively, but uh, you use visual and But very often, they avoid, too. Uh, the kind of little picture arrangement that I mentioned earlier is simply something that's very easy for them to relate to, and you say to them, tell me what you see. With, with a kind of reassuring and reinforcing adult, sometimes these children will pour out a whole torrent of more or less appropriate verbal behavior. And you couldn't, for the life of you, see how the child could have that much uh, behavior verbally if he had the IQ that is supposed to have. <laughs> and you may reason that this is a little bit less penalizing or threatening kind of a two-person arrangement than they provided with the test. That might be more or less valid. Yes? I'm not, I'm not in education, so I want to bring up this point and ask you about bringing the mother and the grandmother in to work in the slum area. Is it possible that these children that uh, work in Head Start, I understand they made some achievement, improvement, and then a year or two later they uh, drop back at the same level of achievement? Uh, is it uh, possible the answer lies in adult education or the training the child with the parents? Uh, is there research to back this up? Or this is 
Yes, it's quite a bit, but of course the picture is still not decisively determined in a number of important respects. Let me first of all say that the research we have about slum children who've been moved out of the slums to essentially different environments is very reassuring. There have been a number of studies that have shown considerable, rather quick, new functional uh, uh, performance for such children who've been moved to different cultures and in different arrangements, presumably creative, stimulating environments. But the research to date on children who continue to live in the slum is much more indecisive. And it may very well be that one of the reasons why it is indecisive is that the bulk of these studies have not included the homes in any kind of functional way. People who studied uh, the linguistic codes of slum parents and have studied the arrangements that exist between slum children and parents, and there are quite a number of studies that have presented this data, suggest that there's a kind of constricted code and a kind of regulatory environment where much of the interaction between the adult and the child is focused upon deportment and behavior and obedience. And much of it is what you might say a command to the child to desist what he's doing and behave. And our data with slum children in remedial sessions suggests that this is exactly the kind of verbal response from adults that extinguishes behavior. And the kind which increases it is the kind of reinforcing response to what the child is doing that is desirable, with a much greater attenuated uh, response in terms of, well, let's say, don't do that kind of function. So you see, it may very well be that it is not the level of language skill of the parent and the home. It may be the kind of home environment in terms of what they teach the child. And this, of course, wouldn't limit just to language codes. It would apply to many kind of creative, conceptual learning areas. And there is a kind of a theory based upon this that some people hold to that this is indeed what is depriving. And this by no means exists in all slum homes. Slum homes are very creative in, in some, I mean, some slum homes are very creative. And the children come to school pretty well equipped. And uh, it isn't just very seldom that we get a student at the University of Kansas from our Juniper Gardens district, but the percentage is low. And wherever we find one, we try to get a scholarship for the child, as we think that can come on into the university environment. But let me simply say that if you want to test this out, do something like we are trying, and that is to set up a cooperative nursery in which you bring the slum mothers in as teacher's aides. And you teach them the sequence of 40 lessons that you're using, and you let them, after instruction, do the teaching with the children. So you're carrying out a dimensional project of teacher training and child training at the same time under supervision. To see whether you can teach these parents to be creative and to participate in a kind of new type of activity with their children. And to see whether this has some carryover effect to the other siblings. There's a variety of ways to test into this, you see. But I have a hunch that one of the reasons why the effect is often lost is that the program as such is discontinued and new conditions become predominant. Yes? In teaching a child to imitate, could one, if you had a child that already had some acquired language, though it is in inappropriate, could one revert back and teach the child to imitate? Well, my my glib suggestion would be that you start with the language he has and you set up some kind of arrangement in which he performs that language and you and you make him feel very proud of it. And don't think that it's inconsequential. If he has only one word, that's where you start. 
And the trouble with much of our teaching is we start far above where the child can function. And that's bound to be rather punishing right off the bat. Yes? What if this child has a great vocabulary on crosswords and the vocabulary he has, then what do you do? Well, no. I would suggest that. <laughs> Essentially, I don't think that's to be entirely ignored. It's that you may seek to extinguish a few of them, but you couldn't disregard all of them. Let's say if he's pretty earthy, you'd have to assume that he got this from some kind of an environmental arrangement. And maybe the first task is to kind of upgrade the environment so that he gets some improved models. And you may, in most clinical arrangements, be able to offer to the child that in some way that you like this a whole lot better than that. <laughs> but if you clobber the child for them, you're throwing away pr principally the one type of dom predominant response he has. And I wouldn't think it would be any more appropriate to punish the child for that than you would punish an adult aphasic who's resuming some semblance of what he used to have and you know perfectly well that automatic speech is probably going to come back faster than than uh, some of the sophisticated conceptual levels, abstract levels that he used to have. And it may be that a perfectly obscene word may be a triumph for an adult aphasic. And why should it be different for... <laughs> well. This is a very complex question. <laughs> I hate to break this off, but Dr. Sheeplebush has been talking almost constantly uh, to one group or another uh, for the past 12 hours. I must say I've enjoyed meeting <laughs> <laughs> And I do hope that all of you appreciate the time and effort he has taken away from his busy tasks he does have to get up at the crack of dawn or probably before dawn to catch uh, a plane out of here. So uh, I would like to say that we've all appreciated having him here. We hope that all of you will take something back to your classrooms which you can put into practice. Uh, this will be followed by a business meeting. Uh, which Dr. Seitz informs me will be short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, those of you who are in uh, classes this evening, unless your professor has instructed you otherwise, uh, I'd like to recommend that you stay and see what CEC is like, and uh, then we should be out in a very short period of time. Let's have a final Thank you for Dr. Sheep.